couple of introductory comments in terms of uh, the schedule. This morning, uh, after my announcements are concluded, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Josh Bales, who will lead us in several songs. Then uh, I will lead us in offering together a prayer of one of the colleagues out of the prayer book, which is why you want to have a prayer book in front of you. Uh, the talk will be then this morning, then we'll take a break. Uh, I am going to give you an assignment on your break time as a way of reflecting on the things that we're learning. And in the session, in a sense, that silent break time where you're given an assignment will in fact count in my mind as a session. Because the difference between a retreat and a conference is that when you're on a conference, you've taken all this information and you're kind of always on the go. Um, you're going from meeting to break to lunch to meeting to break to lunch. And then you, if you make the time, most of us don't, then we go back home and we have the snowboard book. And do we actually make the time to go back and reflect and contemplate on the material and think about its incorporation? Well, maybe if something, one of the things is really good, might, but at least I don't, to be honest. Um, retreats, by con contrast, are meant to be more interactive with silence and with reflection. So you make the time to take a walk or to sit in your room or to sit here in this chapel or in the oratory over in the main meeting space where you're with God and you do whatever you do to <coughs> talk to God and to be alone with God, to reflect on the material, to make the content of that material, or especially the insights of that material, uh, a, a prayer conversation between you and God. And like I said, I'll give you some assignments to frame that in a certain way. But you know if the assignment doesn't work for you, don't do it. You're, the, the point is, is for you to be alone with the Lord and for the two of you to be in communion with each other. Um, and if that happens, whether you're dealing with what I'm talking about or not, that's really coincidental. I mean, I, I'm extraordinarily conscious of the fact that as, as a retreat leader or even as a speaker, what I actually do, this is how I think about this, is that I sort of put out a buffet. And even though there's a theme to the buffet, like I'm going to a Chinese restaurant, so I'm probably not going to get pasta there, unless it's noodles, you know, they're noodles or something. So it is with this. I've got a clear theme that I'm addressing, hopefully you, you see it, um, throughout the talks. But you might say, oh, that really speaks to me. And then you also might go, I'm not sure I actually like that. And see, that's okay with me. It's just a meal. Another way to put it is, is that I'm not your only retreat leader. And you're going to go to plenty more after me, God willing. And you've been plenty more before. And it's only the Holy Spirit who makes alive the things that he wishes to speak to you about. Bad English, but you get what I mean. Um, and then the other piece to this is that there are always new layers of things that he wishes to reveal, even around old themes, not only in terms of things that he's trying to communicate to us about himself, but also things that he's trying to show us about what's happening in our own hearts and what the condition of that is. Um, it's always new in that sense. And so in the midst of all of that, that's why you have that kind of time to be alone with God, to reflect and to think. And then we'll come back together again for really the third session, session one, silent session, and then the third session. And we'll go to lunch. Then after lunch, we will come back here for a Eucharist. And in a minute, I'm going to ask for volunteers to help me with some of the various pieces of it. And, uh, but there will also be a talk, another talk within the context of the Eucharist. We are today, in fact, on our calendar, giving thanks for the life of Gilbert Studdart Kennedy, who, Anglican priest from originally Northern Ireland, went to Trinity College, Dublin, 
and uh, was a chaplain to the British Army in World War I as an Anglican priest. And God used it to literally turn his life inside out. And we'll talk about that, particularly around the theme of what it is that we're trying to address. So, and just a little bit more thematically, and then if there's any questions about just schedule stuff. Today, we're going to talk about blocks in the morning. Okay, if there, there is this call, and we're invited into something here, uh, that we're into this transparent place to be with God. How come I so often, when I get invited to something like that, a part of me goes like this? What's, what's that about? What does that say? And so that's what we're actually going to talk about this morning. The second, the third session, after the silence, will be more about if, if God is beginning to open my hands, what do I do with them? What do I do with them? There's a why to the opening of my hands. And it's not just for my giving. It's for my giving. And, and what does that look like? And so, and then actually with the Eucharist, talking about the life of Stuttgart Kennedy and the lessons that we'll use for that, um, we'll talk about more about the implications of, you know, what do I do with these hands? Uh, the first session will be more personal. The second session on Kennedy will be more social and more corporate, because Kennedy was a priest, poet, and radical activist. And um, so well, that's, that's the shape of what we're going to be doing today. And again, I made the offer last night, if anybody wants to get with me individually over the course of some of our break times, I'm more than willing to make the time to do that. Page 230, we're going to pray aloud together the collect of the proper seven. Page 230, collect proper seven. Let us pray. O Lord, make us have perpetual love and prayers to your holy name. For you never fail to help and govern those who believe us set upon the sure foundation of your loving kindness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God. of a man by the name of Dr. Ashley Null, N-U-L-L, -L, who is considered the foremost, foremost Thomas Cranmer scholar on the planet. Um, he says this. He says, if you were to walk in any medieval English church prior to the Reformation, Here's what you would more than likely see and hear. That somewhere in that church, there would be a picture of the last judgment. And there would be victorious Jesus standing over a divided humanity with the population on his left. Remember, that's where the goats are, if you remember the parable. And they're going into the fires of hell. And it is terrifying. And on the other side is angels, celestial bliss, and people ascending up the ladder into heaven. And how that, in essence, picture would be theologically interpreted by the average country priest of that time would be this. Which side of Jesus do you want to be on? Number one. Well, how do you know? The way you know is by your right living. And you better obey. Because if you don't obey, you see what's waiting for you up there. In other words, the call was obedience. That was the a number one obligation. Hear that word? Obligation of the faithful. And therefore, what they heard from their preacher within the context of the demand for regular attendance at the sacraments and confession and the like, 
was moralism. You better do what you're supposed to do. I hate that thing. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to Archbishop Thomas Cranmer was that he began to hear a, a different song, primarily out of Luther. He was profoundly influenced by the Lutheran movement that was happening. And therefore, when he was challenged to, in essence, create a book of common prayer, meaning a book of prayers that we would say in common together in the vernacular English language, he began with a very different starting point. Sure, he incorporated a lot of the classic traditions and framework for both the Roman Catholic Mass and the Book of Hours. But there was a different kind of theological emphasis. And it had to do with an emphasis of a relationship with Christ, not in the end based on the precarious nature of human obedience. But instead, it was based on what God did for us in Christ Jesus. And out of that, being invited into a heart-love relationship with Him. See, that's very different from which side do you want to be on? And the way you know how to stay on the side of the angels is obedience. And if you don't obey, then God help your soul, especially if you haven't made things right before you die. <clears throat> and this prayer that we offer today symbolizes all that Cranmer means. And, and if I had the day to do this, I, I could actually walk you through the original Cranmerian prayers and especially what we now call right one where this whole emphasis is, is brought about again and again and again, articulated very clearly within the context of the 39 Articles, which were their doctrinal statements of faith. Um, and it's one of the reasons I am who I am, is because of that understanding of both what it means to be a Christian and what God has done in Christ. So look at the prayer again. Because I want to dissect this for a little bit before we get into the scriptures. So where we, he begins is by saying, O oh Lord, meaning you're in heaven and you're in control of heaven and earth, and that means me and all of my circumstances. Notice the verb. The verb is make. In other words, I need you to do something for me that I cannot do for myself. I need you to change my heart. Make me, you see. Do something inside of me that's different. Make me have. Make us have what? Guess what? He's not talking about obedience. Now, obedience is a byproduct, but it's not the center. Instead, he's asking that God make us have two things. And what's the first one? Perpetual what? Love. Uh, right? A heart of adoration. A heart of gratitude. To, to quote a very non-Episcopalian gospel hymn, Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. That, you see, this is what Cranmer is literally introducing into the worship life of a nation. A nation that understood that the responsibilities and the obligations of humanity were, in fact, to obey. And he doesn't say that's wrong. He says, but if that's all you've got, you've actually got a religion based on 
fear of failure, human effort, and a whole lot of law. So he says, no, no, no. Make us to have what kind of love? A perpetual love. Because that's what keeps us. If I know that I am loved by God, and not only I am loved by God, but He is literally changing my affections so that, so that I love Him, and, and that I actually love Him more than I love myself, that invites me into that place of sacrifice. It's that love that literally draws me into a place that I... I don't know that I would go if I really felt like I was alone in the universe. To be alone in the universe just means I've got to protect myself. I've got to watch out for myself because nobody else is. I don't have a lot to count on, so I sure better count on me. That's this. But if I actually know that the Lord of heaven and earth both loves me, and has set, as we will see later in the collect, a new foundation in my life. <coughs> then I can, I can begin to risk. I can begin to open my heart up to things that, to him, to things that I might not have known before. To be taken into places. To be invited by God, called by God, into places that I would never, ever normally go. When, when I propose to my wife, uh, my wife had a very comfortable house in the Orlando suburb. And when I proposed to her, I said to her, Now you know, if you marry me, we could end up any place on the planet. And that if what you want is a house with a pool and people to come and take care of us, you probably need to marry a lawyer, not me. <laughs> It's sort of like, are you up for this? Thank God she said yes. <laughs> and we actually now, in fact, have a house with a pool. Which I think is ironically funny. Um, but, but we didn't always have that. In fact, we've lived in some rather treacherous places. And, and, but God is really... I was up for that. And it had everything to do with the fact that I knew that I could trust the one who rescued me, no matter where it might take me. And it's taken me, actually, in some relatively dangerous places. I mean, literally, war zones. One in the southern Philippines and one in northern Uganda. But God is so faithful. And, and so, and it has everything to do with that sense of knowing that I love, that he loves me, and if he loves me, how, how can I do anything other than to love him? He is, again, to quote another gospel name, he is that love that will not let me go. So, O oh Lord, change my heart. Make us have perpetual love. And then the second thing is reverence. In other words, it is my desire to honor you. To honor you. In other words, love is really not an excuse for self-indulgence. See, going back to last night, that's, oh, I know I'll get forgiven anyway, so it really doesn't matter. I can go ahead and sin boldly, as we said last night, um, because I know that I'll get forgiven and it's okay. There's, there's, there's no reverence in that. There's no desire to honor God. So it, it's twofold. It protects, it protects love from sloppiness and self-indulgence, reverence does. But love protects reverence from terror. The judgment of Jesus before the fires of hell, you see. In other words, both are inextricably important. O oh Lord, make us to have a perpetual Love and reverence for your holy name, meaning all that you are. For what? You never fail to help and govern. In other words, come in time of need, be in charge of our circumstances. Those whom you have set 
Notice not those whom I have, who have chosen to follow you. See, there is still the front end sovereign action of God doing something for us that we could not do for ourselves. You have said, not the place upon which I have been, I have arrived by my effort. No, the place where you have said, what? Upon the sure foundation of what? Notice again, he could have said a lot of things, but instead, the word is loving kindness. The perpetual giving of God's care into the life of his children. That's loving kindness. The perpetual giving of God's care into the life of his children. Now that, you see, that very brief group of words literally is the theology of the Christian life in a nutshell. It's all there. And that's what Cranmer brought to the fore. Which, which is why the very famous prayer that we pray every single time we do Eucharist, or at least most of the time, the colic for purity. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts. What is the rest of it? Tell me. You know. Your Holy Spirit. In other words, God's got to do it. That what? We may perfectly. Notice what? He didn't say that we may perfectly obey. That we may perfectly love you. And what? Worthily magnify your holy name. That's love and reverence. See? It's right there. And that's, that was the new ethos into which that was introduced into the life of the Church of England, of which we are, in fact, you see, the inheritors. One of the reasons that we are so free liturgically to confess our sins is that we know, this, I read this at the beginning of morning prayer, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, what we're not doing is confessing and somehow feeling, although this happens sometimes, we sort of feel like, you know, I'm in the wheel, and nothing can change it. And rather, that, that is in fact, through that confession and absolution, that in fact a change is being worked in us in a way that actually frees us to come into some new places in our life so that we don't feel stuck. There is, in fact, that gift of what is being imparted. And, and I hope that you, by faith, when you hear the word of absolution spoken in your churches, you, you appropriate that. I, I mean, there to be, I don't know, some of you have prayed like literally with me, but often what happens is that when somebody lays hands on me and prays for me, I actually say it out loud, I go, oh, I receive that. I like, I come into alignment with what's just been prayed for me. And, and I, I pray that you would do that with the words of absolution. Because that's what they're meant to do. They are meant to both speak God's word of pardon, the assurance of forgiveness, but also work in you the impact, the effect of that forgiveness that actually touches the very, the very depths of your soul. That teaches you that, number one, I can come to God about anything. I don't have to be hidden. But more about that later. I, in fact, in my very prayers, that I pray with my brothers and sisters, we can come before God transparently as we are, knowing that in the offering of, and here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, this is Cranmer's language again, ourselves, our souls, and bodies. That what God is going to do is say, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Now, who are you? Now, what are you doing here? Why are you even in here? I know what you did just an hour ago. I know even the crooked things you were thinking about as you made your way into the pew. And you now have the audacity to come and ask for me to give, forgive you. You're going to do the very same thing again. See, if, if, if that's your God image, you're always, you're always going to be like that at some level or another. 
And so the word of absolution says something very, very different. Almighty God, what have what? What's the word? Mercy. Mercy. See, that's the very first thing out of the mouth of the person present, pronouncing absolution. It literally levels the playing field. I'm not there to earn anything. I know I don't qualify. I absolutely know that if it were a question of the balancing scales of justice, I would be out. I'm willing to take full ownership and responsibility for the very things that I confess. I am not a victim. I am a perpetrator. And I lay before God all that there is. And therefore, what do I ask for? And what does God give me? I ask for mercy. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, because of his death and resurrection. Strengthen you in all goodness, you see. That's breaking the bond of that sin pattern. Strengthening you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, no, not my human effort, please. By the power of the Holy Spirit, what? Keep you. Holding you in the hollow of his hand. Keep you in eternal life in eternal life. Not kind of keeping you like I'm going to push you from behind, but literally holding you. Holding you. Keep you. You see, when you live in liturgy at a superficial level, what happens is, is that you miss the nuances. And it's all in there. It really is all in there. We and many of our churches have the glory of, in fact, even if the sermon is just dreadful, which is sometimes the case, we still have the structure that, in fact, proclaims the full gospel as it is meant to. If a church service or is organized well, there is this profound coherence between music, liturgy, scripture, sermon, that all come together to speak in a kind of many-faceted voice. Not one voice, per se, more like a chorus that sings different parts, communicating to us both at the intellectual as well as at the affective, intuitive level, what it means to be welcomed into that place where we stand with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven and know that we belong. It's actually not out of place for us to be there. Not again because of what we've done, but because God has chosen to call, invite, forgive, and make in our hearts what is necessary for us to be with Him and to know that we're welcome. That's what happens, you see. Now, why do I say all of that? Besides the fact that I love to talk about it. Turn with me over to 2 Corinthians. Here's the text. <clears throat> now, context. We're in chapter 5. Paul is in a huge dilemma. The dilemma is, is that while the gospel has been preached in Corinth, a church has been planted. There have been some other people who have moved in, leaders, in his absence, saying, yeah, Paul got some of it right, but not all of it. And all through, especially this portion of but the whole, really, all of 2 Corinthians, there is this kind of, there's an effort on his part to somehow try to legitimize both him as a human being who has integrity as a bringer of the gospel, but more importantly for Paul than his own integrity, the integrity of his message that I really am bringing something that comes from God, 
to you. I'm just not making this one up. And, and therefore, for him, the fact that they're being taken into a very, very different direction is for him a cause of alarm. And so, the letter, all of 2 Corinthians, and it's kind of jumbled in a way, you sort of skip around a lot, um, it is this plea. Um, and it's like, please pay attention, don't pay attention to these other people, they're taking you in the wrong direction, and listen, I, I know that I can be a little crazy at times, and I'm eccentric, I'm just another broken man like the rest of you. But what I have to give to you is of eternal importance. Please don't go away from it. I mean, that's, that's sort of Second Corinthians in a nutshell. That, that kind of plea. And that's the mood he's in when he's, he's in this passage. And 5 and 6, this whole section is jam-packed with stuff. So, and I can't do it. So what I want to do is just really work on a very small portion of it, which actually starts with verse 13 of chapter 5 through the end of the chapter. So, in the midst of all of this criticism, Paul says, for if we are beside ourselves, in other words, if we're really out of our minds, that's the criticism, he's a fanatic, you know. If we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right minds, in other words, if we're trying to talk to you at a rational level about what it is that we believe, that's for you. In other words, I'm really not crazy here. For what's really going on, for the love of Christ urges us on, or some translations, and I like this, say, for the love of Christ compels us. Hmm. You see, there, there's a motivation in here as to why this very upper middle class, very well-educated rabbi got knocked off his horse, struck blind, and instead of persecuting Christians, he actually was the proclaimer of the gospel and a trailblazer that this Jew would never, ever go into the house of a Gentile, was actually bringing the gospel to people for whom, historically, Israel said, dogs, gleaning, we want nothing to do with them. Which, see, is actually most of us. Thank God for Paul, we might not have heard the gospel had it not been for him. I I don't know where your family came from. Most of mine came from some portion of Great Britain. And if the gospel hadn't come to Great Britain, more than likely my forebears, and maybe even us here in the United States, would still be drinking blood out of skulls. You know? I mean, Celtic religion, right? So, I'm a dead. I'm glad Paul was out of his mind for God. So, we are convinced that one has died for all. In other words, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Therefore, all have died. In other words, who are we? We are without him dead in our trespasses and sins, to quote Ephesians. And he died for all, so that all who might live, what? No longer for themselves, but for him. In other words, that's why I'm doing this. He's, he's describing both his motivation. But he's also trying to set a pace for these Corinthians. That the focus of the Christian life is not actually my personal betterment. See, that's, that's not righteousness, talking about last night. But rather that instead, that God might so change us, so that we might live no longer for ourselves, but who? For him who died and was raised for them. In other words, if God is working my life, then this is the inevitable flow of God's work. It is the inevitable flow of God's work. Which is why it is so incredibly important to understand that the goal of the Christian life is not so much to fit me for heaven, although it is that, nor is it fact to somehow make me a more uh, moral or upright person, although it is that. It, it's not even to teach me a way to think correctly around issues of doctrine and belief, although it is that. But those are lessons. They're not central. The fruit, the real purpose, 
is that so that I might no longer live for me, but instead live for him. And what it means to live for him is to do this, you see, to be available for God to use me in the lives of other people, because you see, that is righteousness. And that's the new nature of what Christ is working so that when we enter into these times together, even if we were, are wrestling at a profoundly <clears throat> theological level, and while that satisfies parts of my mind, and I'm in fact called to love God with my mind, as well as with my heart and soul and all my strength. In other words, we're not a religion that says, what's the old cliche, you don't check your brain at the door. No, we, we, we should and can wrestle at a profoundly personal and intellectual level with the things that are being taught. But the end result is, but the net result of that is not meant to be intellectual enlightenment. There are aha moments, but the aha moments are meant to shape me, not merely satisfy a piece of intellectual curiosity or have that moment where when the other shoe drops and I go, oh, the logical question if I'm being shaped is to say, how does this change who I am and what I do? In other words, there's always, as a result, a kind of social, moral, outreach implication to even the things that we're wrestling with theologically if we're going to be true to the spirit of the biblical texts. It is possible, you see, whether you're talking about a seminary or an adult forum, to get things that are really very interesting about the Christian life, but it actually doesn't affect my behavior at all. Oh, I really loved what he said about that, 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 that. But I still go and do all the same things I've always done. That's, that's not what I consider faithful Christian intellectual development. Not if the call is to love God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and my neighbor is myself. Love. So, and that's what Paul is doing. Paul, you see, the people who were wrestling against Paul, you know, we don't know a lot about them. Typically, they're called Gnostics, which is about secret knowledge, and this is the way of understanding, and it's not different, it's not the same as what he is. The real issue is I read the text, and the danger of that is, is that it, it, myop it myopically takes me into the center of myself. And that's not Christian. No matter who's using the language. Because Christianity at its heart is meant by the Spirit of God to empower you, forgive you, and change you. So that the net result is what? You shall be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Pentecost is the capstone, in other words, of everything that Jesus said and taught. It is the empowering outworking of all that Jesus has laid out in his teaching. And all that is demonstrated in his life. Which is why Jesus goes so far as to say... You know, if you believe in me, you're going to do what I do, yea, even greater works, because I go to the Father. If the goal of the Christian life is my own personal development, Jesus would never make that kind of emphasis. So, what does this all have to do with, well, then why am I like this? <laughs> in the face of such love, why am I like this? Well, let me talk about it. That, in fact, is a description of life like this. And I realized that I had, in fact, a false perception about God. Actually, a God that looked a lot more like my dad than the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, a part of how this change can be described is going from heritage, our heritage, into inheritance, our inheritance in Jesus. 
But a part of what is required of us if we're to make that movement is to look at our heritage in the light of our inheritance. Let me describe mine, just for example. Um, I grew up in a suburban home in Richmond, Virginia. I, both of my parents were, um, how will I describe it? They were people for whom accomplishment was king. I really was judged, not too strong a word, on the basis of my performance, whether that was academics, or talent, sports, you fill in the blank. I, I, I still remember uh, one of the best and the worst things that ever happened to me was my parents sent me to a private kindergarten. And one of the things that they did at that kindergarten was test you to see, this was long before outcome-based education, but they would test you to think about where they were going to place you. I had the uh, fortune or misfortune, depending on how you think of it, of testing out relatively high. That became the sort of Damocles over my head throughout my academic career. Because if I did poorly or even mediocre, the word that would come more often than not from, well, both parents, would be, you know, you're smarter than that. <laughs> and, and so I always lived with the sense that I was underachieving in relationship to my capabilities. And that actually became the overall message of what I heard from my family. So no wonder I understood the Christian life was about Accomplishment, see? And that's something very, very different than everything that we've been talking about this morning, including Cranmer's Collins, which is why I started there. And so what that produces is both a determination not to fail, so you grip, and, in fact, a certain fear of disappointing others. Because more often than not, if there is a closed fist, inside that closed fist is a fear of losing something. And that's why I hold on to it so tightly. It could be the fear of losing reputation. Fear of failure. Fear of not measuring up. Fear of not being competitively a winner. Or at least impressive, if you don't get first place. At least impressive, for crying out loud. That, that's what was literally born into me. Day in and day out. Now that was complicated by the fact, as an Anglo growing up in a relatively successful suburb, I was taught a very clear social pecking order. That there were some people that were better than, and some people that were less than. And so if you combine that sort of striving toward accomplishment, that sense of being in a place because that's how you've been made, you're smarter than that, then you have a tendency to literally judge other people by virtue of their social accomplishments or standing. And so that's literally how I was taught to look at other people. So, what would I do? I would judge people by appearances. And that gets translated in making sure that my appearance really looks good. Or at least is faithful to my vision for how I see myself. You see. Which in my case has to do with things like Preppy Brooks Brothers clubs. <laughs> things like that. It could be true for anything. I'm just, I'm just giving me as a kind of really bold example. It, 
it, it has to do with the way you carry conversations, the things that you, you even teach your children about, things like manners and courtesy. Uh, you believe the dictum that manners define a person well, a lot more, in fact, than education. It has to do with having to wrestle with the fact of catching yourself, looking at someone and automatically going to a place of judgment because they're not like you. Because if they're not like you, either they're farther up the pecking order and therefore you're insecure and jealous, or they're below you and you're sort of looking down, or at best being kind. Isn't that just awful? Mm -hmm. But that's, that's how I was trained, you see. And it has overtones about class, about race, all kinds of ways about how you think about what it literally means to be human. And then, depending on gender, there are very clear gender expectations about what it means to be female and what it means to be male. And if you don't measure up to that, then that's another issue, you see, whether you're muscular, or whether you're thin, whether you're petite, or whether you're masculine, accomplished on the fields of sports. You fill in the blank. It's all about living up to other people's expectations. So how do you deal with a God who says, I don't really care about any of that? Because you know he really doesn't. Which is why he can deal with Pharisees and prostitutes and treat them both the same. Because he has no internal Geiger counter about who is more valuable than others. Gosh, I had to learn that. But the only, it, it wasn't just a question of learning how to look at people differently. I had to learn how to see myself differently. As a value in the eyes of God, shaped in a very particular way by his sovereign hand, so that I might serve in a particular kind of capacity. It's a different way of looking at things. And it's actually a very different way of looking at yourself. So to go from here to here, at least for me, is learning how to let go of the fear of other people's opinions. It's learning how to let go of images of myself that I may or may not be able to live up to. It's learning how to let go of perceiving God as someone not unlike my parents who would judge me for failures. Therefore, I really can't be honest in his presence because if I'm that, he will walk away. See, all of that's personal to me. You might have a different set of things that you hold on to, but almost always the closed fist has everything to do with about a fear of loss of something or someone. And what it exhibits, you see, there's only one thing that casts out fear. I've already quoted the passage. What is it? Perfect love. Not conditional love. I will love you if, if you succeed. I will praise you if you do well. But perfect love that not, has no tinge of that kind of conditional commitment. It is only that kind of perfect love that casts out that place of fear that's in here, you see. And so it's not a question of, you see, beating yourself up because I still have fists in my life or your life. But rather understanding of saying, God, can I really talk to you about what's inside my fist? I really talk to you about that? You know, there actually might be some part of me that is afraid to open it up because I'm not sure I want to see what's in there either. That's especially true if there is shame attached to those losses and failures. And if you live under condemnation as a weapon to bring obedience, there are places of shame. Even if you don't have the more obvious ones, like being the subject of physical or sexual violence. 
Those are there too for some. But shame, in fact, is another word for the feeling of condemnation. I can't find my way out. I can't find my way out. So, fear, fear of loss, shame, and actually fear of loss having to do with what if I become somebody different than this image that I've been working on for so long, or this way of living that I've accepted as, as normal? Let me tell you a story. When I first moved to Orlando, I was curate at All Saints Winter Park, and I was 24 years of age, a child on a clergy collar. I, I was so green, I didn't know anything. <laughs> yeah, really good. Uh, there was a small group of young adults at St. Michael's in Orlando that were forming a group for Christian singles. It came out of the fact that three or four very close friends had all gone to the University of Florida together, had all pledged the same fraternity together, had all run into the same Episcopal priest there who was leading a Bible study at this fraternity house at the University of Florida, and they all came to faith in Christ through this man's witness. Not what you would expect to happen at a fraternity, would you? But that's what happened. And so they graduated from college after ha having really been in four years a very close fellowship with each other. And so they say, we moved back to Orlando. What are we going to do now? We're not getting it in our local churches, so what are we going to do? Oh, I know. We're going to form a group. Bible study, prayer. We'll have fun together. We'll go places and do things. We'll eat. We'll have a great time. But we'll really be a place of support for each other. So they were cooking all of this up. And it just so happened that one of their leaders was playing the music on, oh, this was way back, like Curcio 12 or 10 or something like that. And I had made Curcio number one in the Diocese of Virginia as a seminarian at VTS. And um, so I, at, at, at All Saints Winter Park, they had this fleet of clergy on the staff. Mm -hmm. And since I was the young kid, I was perfectly free to go speak on a Sunday morning and to do Christina talks. So I did. And it was wonderful because I literally basically met the leadership of the diocese at the time of around 1977 or so. And uh, people, many of whom actually are still friends. And, and so I was giving a talk where one of these men was leading worship. And after it was over, he and I were the very same age. He came up to me and said, Craig, we're forming this thing called a YES group. It stands for Young Episcopal Singles. Um, would you be interested in helping us out with it? Well, sure. I was really looking forward to actually meeting some people my age. And so, and especially people my age that were not affiliated in the church where I was serving. I could just go kick back and have fun. So I said yes, and the bonus was, a year later, I actually met my wife through that group. Mm -hmm. But what happened was, is that we were doing a teaching one night on the work of the Holy Spirit. And um, the way we organized it, it was a very small group. There were like 20 of us. If people wanted individual and personal prayer, a friend of mine named Bruce was, and I were doing it together, they actually would come up, and they were willing to do that, say out loud to all of us what they wanted prayer for, and then we would pray. He and I, for this particular individual. Well, this woman came up and she said, you know, every time I hear talks about the Holy Spirit, I, I just feel like there's something inside of me that does this. And I, I don't like it. There's like a block inside of me to God. You know? And it always happens when their teachings just like the ones you gave tonight. It's like, what did I do? And, uh, and, and, I, and it, when you're in a situation like that, at least for me, what I do is, okay, God, what do I say now? <laughs> and it just came to me. I said to her, I said, have you ever made fun of charismatics, Pentecostals? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and she did this little routine that was actually hysterical fun <laughs> about people who raise their hands and speak in tongues. <laughs> and I said, 
But, so what would you do if God said he wanted you to be like that? Oh, no. God would never do that. <laughs> I, I said, here's what I'm thinking. It seems to me that what you've done is created a very hysterical character to And you've created that character to us a way to block the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And you're willing to, in essence, say, I'll say yes to him, but I don't want to be like that. And it seems to me that, because see, that's, that's fear. That's what that is. And I said, so long as that's in your life, my hunch is there's always going to be that block. Are you willing to let that go? And to say yes to God regardless of what he does with you? Even if it doesn't fit into your heritage? She had to think about that. Which I was glad for. She wasn't being flipped, you see. She really pondered it. She got very still. She was actually a very gentle and humble, lovely young lady. And then she looked up at me, and you could see actually even the difference in her face. And she said, yes, I, I think I can do that. And I was like, okay, then let's pray. And so Bruce and I prayed really with her, not just for her, but with her. Because, aside, my understanding of this kind of prayer is that it's not I'm the doctor and that person is the patient. Because that's just not true. Only, the only physician is Jesus. <laughs> that instead, the model is, we go into the presence of God together and then see what God wants to do. And therefore, they're engaged. I ask, what's God doing? What's happening with you right now? It's more interactive than that because we're in it together, you see. I, I'm not the one on high. And so we did. We got into that and, and we began to pray for her. And you could feel it. It was like her whole body began to relax. I could, we had our hands on her shoulders, and I could literally feel her, her shoulders begin to relax. And this great wave of peace just came over her face. And she began to pray in tongues. <laughs> it was lilting. It was lovely. And the joy on her face was just remarkable. You see, a part of what we have to ask is... What is it about my heritage that creates this? Meaning my perceptions, what I've been taught, whether it be by parents, friends, clergy, church, that in fact are actually blocking me from living life with hands open to God and hands open to others. And so, as we close this session, that's your assignment. Hmm. I want you to get along with God. I want you to write things down. Whether you do that on a piece of paper or on an iPad or whatever you've got. And just first of all, describe your heritage. Who are you? Where do you come from? What were the messages that you have been taught that continue to be the things that you live for? There's some things we learn to let go. When I was a child, but now that I've become a man, there's some things you learn to let go. But there are also a lot of deep, deep lessons that stay with you that inform a lot of who you are. And I want you to ask God to show you what those are. In other words, this is a prayer moment where you get alone with God and say, Okay, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, show me. And then write down what it is that you see. And then ask yourself, because some of it's good, some of my heritage, I'm very, very pleased to own. But there's parts of it that are really quite wicked, all mixed up together. Which is how it is, you see. We live in a fallen, fallen and broken world. We know in part. We all make mistakes. I, I kid <laughs> about, you know, when I say to my kids, I said, yo, you'll probably need to go for inner healing prayer at some point in your life. <laughs> I mean, that's just how it is. I, I, 
So, and out of, so it's, it's in some ways good to thank God for the good that you received. But also, Lord, how do I learn how to let go of the things that keep me from being your servant? Where are the, where are the closed fists? And if you can, begin to say, teach me how. Make me, to quote the collect, teach me how to let go of that and give it to you. 